Now left with only her passion and ambition, Besant turned her attention to the plight of young women working in London's newly built factories. Dangerously overcrowded and poorly ventilated, many women lost limbs and their lives to these machines. At the Bryant and May Match Factory, the chemicals used were deadly, and many employees grew sick and died from bone cancer. Who cares for the fate of these white wage slaves? Born in slums, driven to work while still children. Who cares if they die or go on the streets, provided only that the Bryant and May shareholders get their 23%? Besant's outrage led her to action. In 1888, she helped organize these young women in a strike against Bryant and May. And after three weeks of picketing, the company gave in to Besson's demands. The work week was shortened, their pay was increased, and working conditions were greatly improved. The success of the strike did dramatically strengthen Besson's reputation. Those who loved her became all the more devoted to her. Those who felt that she was, um, you know, Satan incarnate now were confirmed in their belief because she was seen as destroying the fiber of, uh, of English society. At 42, Annie Besant had found success helping to unionize unskilled workers, igniting open discussion on the subject of birth control, and drawing attention to the cause of women's rights. But Besant saw that, essentially, society remained unchanged. Ultimately, she wanted to address the root of all human suffering, and she needed a more transcendent path, one that fulfilled the needs of the soul as well as the body. Annie Besant didn't know that her search was about to come to an end. To an unlikely rebel came an unlikely prophet. Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky was a Russian aristocrat who abandoned her husband smoked cigars, and cursed openly. Like Annie Besant, Madame Blavatsky was a woman of extremes. People either really loved her because there was something very endearing about her, or they hated her because uh, she could also be very abrupt and, and uh, fierce. Madame Blavatsky was more than just a maverick. She was really a threat, I believe, in a lot of ways. She was challenging the orthodoxy of certain Christian traditions, though she had a lot of people very upset. While in New York in 1875, Blavatsky and an American colleague, Henry Olcott, founded a spiritual organization that promoted universal brotherhood. They believed that all religions, philosophies, and even science could serve as paths towards truth. They called it the Theosophical Society, meaning the divine wisdom of God. Theosophy does provide a method by which different religions can be understood in a respectful manner, can be appreciated for what it is that they have to offer. So it draws heavily on Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Taoism, Gnosticism, Christianity. All of this is in there and it takes them all very seriously no matter what the culture. Theosophists believe that all humanity is one family. We're brotherhood. But beyond that, if there is but one source of life, if there is one life everywhere in the universe, then that life is precious. And to destroy any part of it is to destroy ourselves. You know the famous words of the poet John Donne, no man is an island, each one is a part of the continent. We're all part of each other. Theosophy does say that the religion that holds the special truths is Hinduism. And Theosophy incorporates as part of its core doctrines the belief in reincarnation and the belief in karma, that our actions to today create our own destiny and our actions today will determine how we are reincarnated. Blavatsky condensed her theories into a book she called The Secret Doctrine. And when it was published, it was given to Besant for review. Her radical colleagues assumed that she would disparage the book. Instead, it overwhelmed her. I was dazzled, blinded by the light in which disjointed facts were seen as parts of a mighty whole. And all my puzzles, riddles, problems seemed to disappear. 
I knew that the weary search was over and the very truth was found. I think that she found those answers to the questions that she was asking about what really is the source of suffering and what really is the path out of suffering beyond just addressing the physical needs of people. To the shock of her friends, Besant eagerly sought out a meeting with Madame Blavatsky. When Besant met her, she got caught up in sort of the R of Blavatsky and fell at her feet. She said she felt like a wild animal that has now been tamed. Once again, Annie Besant reinvented herself. She retreated from her commitments, drifted away from her activist colleagues, and devoted herself to theosophy. Having spent 15 years dedicated to improving the working and living conditions of the poor in England, Besson now abandoned this cause, and in 1894, she moved to India. In her idealized image of the East, Besant believed she had found a culture that stressed spiritual growth rather than material gain. India is the mother of religion. In her are combined science and religion in perfect harmony, and that is the Hindu religion. And it is India that shall be again the spiritual mother of the world. She spoke about India in a way that almost sounded like she had been there earlier, and she did come to believe that she had actually been Indian in earlier lives, and it was a bad karma made her British, and that in later lives she would be reborn as an Indian uh, because of her good works on, in, the, in this world. But for her, India was the other, completely different from Britain. Besant's skills as both orator and organizer drew thousands of new members to Theosophy. Every year, spiritual adventurers from around the world flocked to hear Besant's message. It is said that wherever she traveled, she spoke without a note, and she could grasp people. She could really take hold of people. There was a passion in her. But in Besant's calling as a theosophist, she didn't totally abandon her activist roots. In particular, her passion for India carried over to the welfare of its people. During India's prolonged fight for independence from Britain, Besant became one of the few English champions for Indian home rule. As a result, she once again paid a high price for her beliefs. The British government jailed Besant for over three months. She was a woman who had to have a cause, I think. And that cause of Indian independence, she had a wonderful vision for it. I think she felt that that India must reclaim its proper place in the whole family of nations. This made her extraordinarily popular with Indian nationalists. Here she was, a white British woman, but now she becomes Mother Besant and truly the representative of Indian nationalism. 